Welcome to the Norprom Podcast, and thank you for joining us today. However you may be listening, iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, or through any of the podcast platforms, thank you for being here. I'm your host, Pete Newbig, and we have a great show today. We have Deb Newell with Real Time Consulting, formerly of Minnesota, now in Utah. And uh, today we're going to discuss implementation and how, uh, how people have a hard time implementing uh, when they go to a conference. So uh, Deb Newell, MPM, RMP, and now an MBA, owner of Real-Time Consulting Services and broker and owner of Real-Time Leasing located in Minneapolis. Deb started rehabbing investment properties as a hobby in 1998. Although that sounds like she, she, I think she's much younger than being able to invest properties in 1998. But as a result, like many of us in 2000, she began Real-Time Leasing, a property manager company for almost 21 years now in Minneapolis. And in 2009, she became a licensed general contractor and launched and launched a separate maintenance group. So uh, Deb's a, one of them go-getters. Seems like everybody I have on the show is like a type A go-getter personality. She's a self-described fixer, entrepreneur, strategic leader, consultant. Deb offers one-on-one -on -one consulting for the property management industry. And Deb has also given back to NARPM. She served as an RVP, she served on governmental affairs, and she's a vice chair and chair for other committees for, for NARPM. So I look forward to speaking to Deb here in the next few minutes. But first, I want to talk about our hot topic of the day, or as I like to say, the hot topic. So what I, my, my biggest gripe when I go to these conferences are all these people that go to conferences, they get hammered, they try to hook up or whatever they try to do. They don't go to the day, like, uh, they, they come in late to the, to the, you know, to the, to the breakouts or they don't show up at all. They're not meeting anybody. They don't have any st strategic goals unless you call hooking up a strategic goal, but they don't really have anything going on. And then they go home and they're like, well, I had a great time, but you know, all, the conference offers really no value. And then they don't go to a conference or they just go just to go and have a party or go. That's called a vacation to me. Right? So when I want to go on vacation, I love my NARPM friends but I also want to learn from them. So I, I want to go on vacation with my family and like my, 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 my buddies, my, my high school buddies, my college buddies. Right. So I love you all not from people, but that's not what I'm there for. So when you go to a conference, you should have what I call smart goals, right? They should be specific, measurable, action oriented results, uh, results driven and time specific. Right. So think about this. Like if you were going to buy a Toyota four runner and you're driving down the highway and all of a sudden, all you see are Toyota four runners. Well, they were always there, but now they're there now because you've seen them because you are noticing them because you have this at the top of your mind that you're going to buy a Toyota 4Runner, right? It's called RAS, Reticular Activity Senses. And now that you're, in, now that you're thinking of it, you're, you're attuned to it, right? So when you go into a, any kind of conference or seminar with these SMART goals, now your brain is ready to go and it's going to be in tuned for what it is that you're trying to accomplish, so this way, when you hear somebody talking about something that you have a smart goal about, you're like, oh, and you get, gravitate towards that conversation, right? Or you're going to a specific event because you have a specific smart goal. Now, every time I go to a NARPM conference, especially, or any conference, that conference costs a lot of money, right? You got, you got airfare, you got hotel, you got food, and you got the conference itself. So I always wanted to at least have at least one item that would make that conference pay for itself, whether that's, you know, a new program, a new fee, a new process, or maybe it's just a new vendor, you can reduce costs, reduce expenses, whatever it is, but that conference had to pay for itself. Now, what I used to do is I'd go to a conference, I had my smart goals, and I'd take all my notes in the front of my notepad. Yes, I'm old school, and I have notepads and not iPads. But I would have tasks, and I would put the tasks on the back of the pad. On the back of the pad, and a task could be reading a book. The task could be meeting, you know, three three people, following up with a vendor, whatever it was. And I'd have all these tasks. And at the end of the conference, on the plane ride home, I would prioritize the tasks. Some I would get rid of, and some I would, you know, I would prioritize one through whatever fifty seven, however many tasks I had. Now, what I love about the NARPM conferences is that you have one in April, you have one in October. So I'd have all my tasks, and I would try to accomplish all the tasks before the next conference. Now, a couple of things that happened was I had too many tasks, too many ideas that I wanted to do, and I overwhelmed my team. And hopefully, Deb and I will talk about that a little bit. Um, so you don't want to overwhelm your team. 
But the, the, main, the main thing is you want to do something. So a lot of times people create all these tasks, have all these grandiose plans and ideas for their business. And then they get into the office, they open the door and they get smacked. Or as Mike Tyson would say, punched in the mouth. And what happens is life gets in the way, work gets in the way. And those tasks, those ideas, those plans go into a draw, never to be seen again until the next conference. And then they are, uh, now they have tons and tons more of things that need to do, that they need to do. One of the examples that I put out there, I was at Texas State Conference. I went out there, I had, an idea, I had a smart goal of, I wanted to make, you know, I wanted to create a couple of fees that would pay for that conference and make, make me more money. And that's when I learned about the risk mitigation and the pet guarantee. Wrote them down within two weeks, I implemented them. So I'm an implementa implementation specialist is what I call myself at Empire when I owned it. Uh, that's what I do, I implement. But what I realized is not everybody's wired that way. And most people have a hard time implementing. So Deb, let's bring you in. That was my hot topic. Uh, you know, by the way, I have to ha I have to tell NARPM we have to have a little uh, a little deal that says that the, uh, the opinions of Pete are not necessarily those of NARPM. So, <laughs> so Deb, you you've been consulting. It sounds like one of those medical, like those uh, pharmaceutical ads that I see on TV, and they have that fast talking person at the very end with a little small print. That's <laughs> yeah, actually you, right? Else, I like yeah, the car company. Yeah, cause you to have a stroke or you know get pregnant or whatever it is. That's that right. Will happen. So Deb, you've been consulting for a long time now. You've been in this business a long time. And when I asked you, what did you want to speak about today? You well, you said, I love implementation. Let's talk about implementation. Yeah. So yeah, but I think it's important to actually also clarify that there is a difference between an integrator and an implementer. So people get those often confused, right? So, um, so you want to make sure that you understand that the implementer is, you know, besides the fact that it kind of sounds like being an integrator, that, that they're very different. So um, you mentioned that you're like the implementation person where you, when you were with Empire and that that's what you did, it's all about implementing that whole business and the operating piece of it. Um, and so that's, you know, making things kind of move forward. Um, so the integrator really is that person who's gonna take the ideas from like, usually the owner of the company, the guy who has like all this vision of what they do and they, they drive that execution, but they don't necessarily implement it into action. I don't know if that makes sense. Well, and I find that most business owners are the visionary. And well, so sure. that yeah, they're, they not, are. they're no, not they're very not. good. But there are some that are both the visionary and the integrator, meaning that they're going to they're gonna envision this. They have the great idea. They've gotten the idea. And then they're going to integrate it, but they can't implement it. So they kind of started the action path. But what they've done is they really just dumped it on somebody else. And they're like, okay, now they're great they delegators, right? They advocate right? it. Advocate, is that what it is? Or delegate, yep. right? So they're yeah, Well, delegate means path. that I'm going to manage it. Advocate means I, just, wow. I have this idea and I just dump it on you and then I go That's away. True. Good point. Good point. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I had think a great abdicator and my business partner name, no names to be named. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Steve. Just so kidding. I think, um, yeah, the reason why I like implementation is because it's the, it's the biggest roadblock for companies to become successful and change. So the, the challenge is, is that you talked a lot about going to these conferences and you are very rare, by the way, having a plan like that, that's not common. Now, I think people do have ideas when they go to these conferences in the back of their head, they're like, you know, I, I really hope I can learn X, Y, and Z. They've, they've looked at the agenda, they're, they're looking at the sessions and they're saying, I'm gonna go to, you know, this breakout session because they're, you know, one, I like the speaker or two, this is a topic I really wanna learn about. So I think after they've looked at the schedule of events, then they kind of decide this might be my plan. When yeah, which I, is which is a great a great way to do right. it. It is, and what I what I even say, take one step further. If you're bringing anybody from your team to any of these conferences, especially the like the national conference, the team should never sit together. They always go to different sessions, and they each have to bring back to the rest of the team or to the or even if you have a small team, when you go back to work, essentially that you have a meeting and that you all together like digest what each other has you know done because you, you know sometimes there's like four of them at one time and you're like i want to go to all four but you can't do that so it's really divide and conquer and and that's the best way to do it so even if you don't necessarily pull away a vendor or you don't implement a fee right away the biggest thing is networking and listening to other people and hearing how they do it it's more of a mentoring at that point it's peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and realizing that you're not the only one that 
struggles through all these things and going through all of this that other people also, and this is how they solved it. So it may be one little nugget that you took away that solved the problem that you were having. And that was, that was a game changer for you. And that I think it builds upon other things because then the next conference you're like, okay, that solved that problem. Go to the next conference with talking to your team saying, hey, give me a list of like five things that we need to work on. And let's see if I can find some answers for that when I go and network with other people. I think that's you call brilliant. It, you called it hooking up, I call it networking. <laughs> <laughs> right? I think that's brilliant. Asking your team, if, if they're not going, asking your team, hey, what are the first, what are the top five issues, challenges that we're having so that we can then go ahead and now they're now they're part of my smart goals. So talk talk about that. So everybody go like Mike Tyson famously said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the mouth, right? So how do you how do you consult with your with your customers your clients when they they have all these like they're overwhelmed especially if they first go to a NARP, the first time they're at a NARP conference they get overwhelmed all this information they have all these things they want to implement and then they get back to the office and they get punched in the mouth right uh, there's there's 473 emails and 22 you know owners that want to you know chop their head off and and uh, you know and there's always a challenge out there so there's a couple of things I think you know Todd Orshay what I am dropping a name, I guess, but he's part of NARPM. He actually said something a long time ago where he said, you know, it's something that he actually does is he takes a couple of days off. And I know a couple of other people that do this well as well, but he takes a couple of extra days after a conference um, at that location, wherever he, wherever the conference is at, and he will spend time um, going through, like you were saying, do it on the plane. I think the minute, the minute you hit that plane, you go to the airport, you hit the plane, everything else kind of is put on the back burner. You may take those couple of hours on the plane and kind of look through it, or you just may go to sleep because you're so like exhausted. From so, drinking all, from drinking all, all week. Well, all yeah, week. right. Uh, that's what, that's, that's always a good time. <laughs> but, but I think it's important, however you decide to do it, whether you do it how he's doing it, or you do it the way you suggested, it is taking a little bit of time to, to this is your business. So I think you have to make the time and not just jump right back into it. It can wait one extra day for you to like go through and say, okay, I need to map this out. What's overwhelming to people is that you do take away a lot of information. It's sometimes, it's almost more tiring to go to a conference and get all of this and you're sucking it all in and you're like, I'm, I'm exhausted. I don't know where to start. And that's where a lot of people struggle is they like, I, I don't know where to start. This is all great ideas. I heard this, I heard that. Write it all down and then just take three things. And that's it, three things. You don't have to tackle the entire list, but, but prioritize them by comparing to what your team has said is the issue, what you know are things going on in your company and three things that you know that you can execute in three months. So that's- the going. That's your time-based. Yeah, because because uh, if you can't execute it, and it's going to take a year to execute, you're gonna you can kind of lose steam, yeah. Exactly. You, well, you get discouraged, right? right? I think that's what it is. You lose steam, you get discouraged, and so you have to give yourself. Property managers are notorious for actually being very poor time uh, management people because we have so many things going on. We're very great at multitasking, although I think um, I say that loosely because multitasking also isn't a, a, a something I would promote very well that I, you know, I don't want to say I'm, I'm a great multitasker because that means I can't finish one task. Right. So, right. So multitasking means <laughs> multitasking I can means you don't have any focus. Right. But we all have ADD at this point. So, which is fine. I can, I know I looked at my phone four times while you were talking, just kidding. <laughs> um, so I think that, um, so I like that. So number one is basically have the team, ask the team what the challenges are and, and use that as your smart goals. Number two is take an extra day after the conference uh, and prioritize and just pick the top three things. And so when I prioritized, I, I looked at like importance, you know, and also I looked at what's easy to do, right? What's the easiest thing? Well, that's why I say do? pick three things and then take three months. And then when you're like, oh, I can do that. And maybe you finish in sooner than three months and that's fine. But then, do the next, that, then do the next three things. Yes. And then look at that list again. And sometimes you'll look at that list and go, oh, that's actually not as important as something else. So what I do when I work with companies is they always tell me the symptoms. They're always like, my team is complaining. They're overwhelmed. All of this is going on. I, I, I can't do it. So I look, I'm hearing the symptoms from everybody. I'm, I'm taking the time to meet with everyone, hear what's going on, 
in their position, what their role is, what their functions are, how they're handling everyday processes. And then I'm looking to see what actually is the root cause of all of that. And it could be a person, it could be a lack of a process, it could be the wrong technology, it could be a myriad of things, or it could be a combination of a lot of things. So my role is to kind of go in and that's where I, um, you know, kind of take it all apart before I build it all together again. So it's like Legos, I'm going to just yep. ma mash it all up and then I'm going to build that foundation better again. And so I take I look at this as I'm not emotionally attached to anybody's company. I don't have any emotional attachment to your team. And that's a good thing because I can objectively look at what's going on. And usually the, the owner knows, that, you know, especially when I tell them what's going on, they're like, yeah, yeah, I, I kind of thought so. I was hoping you didn't notice that or, or yeah. But then I have to kind of take all the people out and then build everything how it should be running based off how they want it to run. And then implementing all of those changes. I always say, if you don't change as a company, you're going to die as a company. And that's, yeah, you know, it's funny like for, for a couple of years, I was trying to solve challenges in my company and I would call them like, um, cosmetic changes, right? So mm -hmm. I would maybe implement property mail, big stuff, but still when, what I finally, when I finally solved my major challenges, it, it, the issue was not particularly people, but it was the organizational structure. And some people were not in the right seats. They were the right people on the bus. They just weren't in the right seats. And uh, to tear down and rip down the organizational structure is not an easy task. And in, and uh, it's it's very hard to say, you know what? I don't have the right structure. I'm going to go ahead and do it. And uh, and so, you know, it's um, sometimes when you get back and you and you want to implement something, you realize that you're just kind of putting band aids on exactly. you know on a broken ankle. You know, it's like the, exactly. the, the bone sticking out of your skin, and you're like, oh, I'm going to put some band aids here, right? Yeah, so that's actually, that's a really good point because I, I go in there and I kind of find, I, I'm really able, I have a, a, I have this talent where I can go in and I can discern people pretty quickly. And I can tell that they're, like you said, they're a great asset to the company, but they're just not succeeding in this position. The other thing I also do is, and I see this happen is people go, oh, but they've been so great as a maintenance coordinator. I'm going to throw them in as a leasing person because I'm struggling in that area. I'm yeah. like, don't do that. Keep them as your, if they're successful and they're the expert in maintenance, keep them in maintenance. Don't move them just because you love that this person's loyal. They're always committed because what's going to happen. That person's going to burn out, hate that job and quit. And now where are you at? Right. And now you lost two good people. One that exactly. was doing a maintenance. And yeah, I, I was literally talking to somebody about this two days ago where we're talking about the Peter principle, right? Where they promote to the point of ineptitude. Mm -hmm. And I found as a, as a growing small startup company, I had people that I was loyal to when I actually outgrew them. Yeah. Right. And, and, uh, yeah. and so I would keep promoting them and they just couldn't do the job anymore. Like whether I promote them or not, they we were just outgrowing them. But anyway, so to get back to, get back to like this implementation. Yeah. So now I'm this busy business owner that I'm maybe probably most likely spending 90% of my time in the business, 10% on. And I just spent my week on the business at the conference, right? right? So now I'm, I, now Tyson comes in, punched me in the face. I got these three things that I want to implement. Uh, what are your recommendations? So I take some time off. I want to implement, but now that I'm telling the team who's overwhelmed and they're getting punched by Tyson too, that, right. Hey, we got to do some extra work here. Not only do you have to do your job, but we have to make some change. So no, so you're, before you even do that, I think, um, and I made that mistake years ago as well. And my team always hated it when I went to conferences. Yeah, mine conferences too. <laughs> I, they were like, oh great, she's just gonna come back and everything's gonna change and pivot. <laughs> and I learned that that's not the best thing to do. So you need to find somebody on your team that's going to be that person that can help implement all of this. You, you have to have oversight. So I say still delegate because you still need to kind of know what's going on. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you can't just, you know, you have, have to get, you have to get buy-in from the team too, right? You have to tell them why so, we're going to do this. But I think there's a balance on buy-in as well, because okay. again, notoriously teams hate change. It's very difficult for them. And some don't do it very well. And people, that's a, that's a personality thing. Some people just can't handle change. And, and that's why they're always, you know, they'll always be that position. That I still only in. drink Coca-Cola. I don't drink Pepsi. I don't like to change. <laughs> yeah. And people who know me know that I, I'm in very much the same way, right? If, 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 a restaurant, if I go to a restaurant and they say, and I say, can I have a Diet Coke? And they're like, I have a Diet Pepsi. I'm like, I'll take water. <laughs> like exactly. that's the time I drink water. Yep. So, um, You're so but, yeah, so the thing is, is that you have to 
yes, you need buy-in, but remember, you're you're kind of sharing with them all these things that you learn. You're kind of giving them a very cliff notes version. They don't I know you're understand. they're hearing it secondhand, right? They, they well, didn't hear so the presenter. context isn't there and they don't understand the why. So I love Simon Sinek because he explains the why. You have to explain the why behind you're doing something and why you want to move towards that change. I'm not changing today, guys. Hey, I just we have an idea. We're going to look at possible um, solutions on how to get there, but this is why we're doing it. You have to explain that because if they don't understand when you do make that change, what happens is because they become empathetic to the wrong people. For example, uh, if you want to charge, uh, if you want to implement a new fee, and it could be to an owner or it could be a tenant, if it's to a tenant and they've never had this fee before, and all of a sudden you're like, we're going to now start charging $100 for this for admin, whatever it is. And you start doing that. You tell your team, you have to do this now. It's it's in the contract. We're going to do this. Then tenants start complaining. And then your team is like, I, I know, I don't know why they started doing this. I'm really sorry. That empathy comes out and they're not loyal to. Well, right. They're not loyal to you and they don't, they don't charge it. Right. Yeah. So, they don't how do you implement, so the way to implement that is to yes, get their buy-in, but explain the why. So before you make the change, you literally have to map it out for them. Some of the things I've done before is um, I've actually, what I'm always amazed at is that teams don't really understand all it takes to actually run a company. And so they get confused because they're just kind of stuck in their own little lane and they see other lanes and they're like, yeah, I really don't want to do that, but I, I'm happy here. But I don't really understand why the owner keeps making all of these changes. One, one of the exercises I've done before is I've actually gone into offices and I've literally mapped out very you know, rudimentary of just saying, here's some, here's the income that comes in. This is it, guys. This is it. Management fees, placement fees. Here's some renewal fees, maybe a late fee here and there. You know, all of these things. It's very little. But, and here's all of our expenses. Like, they don't realize the cost of the software, yeah. the cost of employees. The co you know, and I usually just take an average. I'll say, you know, we're just going to take, we're, we'll take a median salary of 45000 and you know, and there's 10 of you. And, you know, so they can see the picture and literally mapping, like writing it on a, a whiteboard and having them look at it, they understand now why change has to happen. You wanted a raise? Well, guess what? In order for you to get a raise, I have to make some changes. I have to implement new KPIs and new metrics. And in order to do that, I have to do this. So yep. again, it's what we don't do is we don't take the time to explain the why behind all of it. And so all they see is you making a change and miserable. And they're going to get more phone calls. They see you making They're a change. And they got, all, all they see is the 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 fallout. Like, oh, now yeah. I'm just going to get a call. I'm, I don't know what to say. We don't train. We don't spend the time to train them on how to handle these difficult conversations and to handle conflict. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. You have to relate it to them, right? Because all they see again is the is the negative phone call coming in. When and uh, one of the things that I used to do would would be something like that. But I would talk about like, hey, if we want health insurance here. This is what we need to do. We need to make some money. We can give you guys health insurance. So when when we would implement new fees or or anything like that, we would talk about what the benefit is to the company and to them specifically. And I think that's how you get. Um, I think that's how you get some buy-in. That's how you get them on board. Yeah, so I think and, is well said. And where I was going with the buy-in piece again, it's a fine balance because when whenever you want to introduce something and you want their buy-in, they're also going to try to persuade you not to do it, right? Oh, no, no, I, I'm fine. I, I don't need you to implement this new software. I, I, I'm totally great. I don't need to do it. Because they've created all these workarounds. They have their own little system. If they get hit by a bus, heaven forbid, now what? So again, explaining the why. Well, we have to do it this way so we can be cross-functionally trained so you can take some time off. Like put a right. positive spin on it, right? So don't, you know, in case something happens to you with COVID now, you know, people can be out. You can have two, three people out of an office at a time and who's going to do what? So you have to, the reality is you have to tell them we, we have to do this in order to grow. Everybody comes to me and they're like, I want to grow. I want to grow. I want to grow. That's it. Growth will come as long as you have the back office fix. If I can fix sure. the back office, growth will just naturally come. I don't even have to go out and get it. It's just going to come to my door. So that, but you have to have your processes in place. And if you want to grow, and your team is telling you, I am maxed out. I can't do anymore. That's your opportunity to say, great, this is what we're going to do to change that. I'm going to take some of this off your plate. I'm going to give it to so-and-so, or I'm going to put in a new technology and that's going to help you be more efficient, but we got to learn how to do that. And then it, th there's a cost right. to what, it. What is it? A uh, one step back to take two steps forward. Yeah. Right? And there's a cost to it. Nothing's free. 
I, I, I've said this so many times on so many different podcasts, but you know, we pay for so much to run our business and yet we charge so little to manage a property. And there's a huge discrepancy there. And we are not charging for our value or for what we do our worth. At some point, there's going to be some big coup that's going to happen. And we are all going to learn that we need to raise our rates and that people are just going to have to know that that is exactly what is going to happen. We spend, you know, um, owners as, as, you know, who we manage for spend the least amount of money on babysitting and property management. And they're their two biggest assets in their life. They're worth, oh. they're the most valuable and they spend the least amount on those two things. And it's not because they're really trying to be cheap. It's just because no one set the bar for what that value is. Right. Right. So I come in from the conference now. I have, I have all these ideas. Right. I have kind of a team meeting, right? I uh, explain, you know, what we're going to do. Um, what the and you're only going to explain those three things. Remember, you're the only one that's privy to that entire list. Ah, do not smart, share smart. it with you. Do not share it with your entire team. That also will overwhelm them. That'll overwhelm so, them. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. they're going to be, I mean, they'll be like throwing up their hands going, I'm just going to go, you know, I'm quitting. Exactly. Okay. And with, with, the, with the talent shortage that we have, that's the other thing that you have to be careful. It, it, too much of this is going to, uh, they're worried, will I have a job? Like you have to, this is still a people industry. Yes, you still have a job, but here's what's going to change. So only take those three things and share that with the team. And maybe that what they'll do is they'll help you prioritize. Wow, we, we need to do that first. So if you, that's that's the piece where they're going to have the buy-in and they'll feel accountable. They're going to have now. Goals now, do you recommend that? We, do you recommend that this this happens right after I get back from the right after we get back from the conference? Or you well, it depends. It? If it's a Monday, the answer is no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, no. Yeah. Now I will so within, say within should, the week. Within the week. Within the week, and it should be at your team meeting. And now that brings up another good point. If you don't have a team meeting, that better that should be your number one thing you implement right away. If you don't do team meetings every week. That should be your first change. You don't even have to. Here you go. Free. Yeah. And I was going to ask you, you like, you have to go to a conference be, for that one. I was going to. I was going to ask you, should it be part of your quarterly goals? Like, if you're not doing a quarterly goal meeting, do you recommend quarterly meetings as well? Like, uh, I do. With your, I do recommend quarterly meetings, but see, not with the team, though, the just with the size. executive. That's with your executive team. team. Like, who are your decision makers within your company? And for small companies, there'll be like, well, there's just three of us. So it may be that you have an offsite with those three people, um, and make it a little bit of an event. Um, so it's not all about just, you know, because you're strategically planning. I, I've worked with companies where I've done this whole strategic plan for them for the whole year, but I map it out in quarters and so that they don't. So again, my favorite poem, one of my favorite poems I, uh, is by Shel Silverstein. I don't know if you remember him from when we were kids. I don't. He, um, it's the white cover and he had a big whale on the front of it. And the one of the poems was that you can't eat a whale all in one sitting, you have to take it small bites, right? That's mm -hmm. how you eat a whale, essentially. I've heard that with an elephant. Yeah, how do you eat an elephant yeah, one bite at a time? Right, yep. right. Um, and it may have been an elephant. It's been a long time since I read the poem, but it's the same concept, right? So you have to take it in, in very actionable and measurable steps. And so every quarter, which is every three months, that is actionable. Now, I'll say for those that you do have like quarterly rocks or quarterly goals, mm -hmm. and you come back and you have these three things, you really can't jam them in. You, you, may have to, you might have to wait for next quarter, or you might find that you have an answer to a rock that you already have, or you might have, have to replace a goal. Exactly. I was just going to say that. You may have to replace something because something, that's where your team comes into play and they go, well, we you brought up a good point. We really actually have that issue that we need to deal with. So let's put that into place. And so then you move the other one into a further um, strategic goal, further down the road, map it out a different phase. And I was like you, Deb, when I would come back from one of these uh, conferences, I would try to implement everything as soon as possible. And uh, I literally, my team had a uh, uprising. They had to sit me down and basically tell me like, stop. <laughs> yeah. And they so, were like, can you not go to these conferences anymore? Yeah. They and, I, and then I started conference. inviting them to conferences and then they would become part of the conference. And I think they got it. And then they could understand again, it's that buy-in. It's like, how much do you want to invest in your team and how they're the experts in doing the everyday stuff. You're the visionary that built this company, yet you're the only one going to conferences. Interesting. Okay. So you're, you highly recommend that you take one or two team members 
at oh, a yeah. minimum and send them to the conference. Well, that's buy-in and it's also, it's job security. Because why would I leave a company that is investing in me to learn more? Interesting. I like that. And then this way, uh, if you bring your team, then you can go out and, and uh, go booze. Yeah, then and you go drinking with your buddies. Like you don't said. need smart yeah, goals. Exactly, you give right? them the smart goals. That Now that's an owner. That's what I like. Uh, <laughs> that's a baller. <laughs> that's a baller. All right. Well, Deb, I appreciate uh, the time. Do you have any more, any other parting nuggets? Because we're going to go into the lightning round. I'm going to ask you a series of questions oh, and then one to two oh word gosh. answers. And okay. you're going to have, you have to think on your All feet. All right. Let's but, go for it. Any, any it. parting words before we go into the lightning round? Uh, no, I think we covered a lot. So I think okay. we're good. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. All right. Lightning round. All right, Deb, you ready? I don't know. Now I'm nervous. No, they're easy. This. Easy questions. Okay, this go is, ahead. This is a family Just friendly. Don't ask me boxers or briefs because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, what PM software do you use? Uh, Propertyware. What is your current organizational structure for the PM, uh, for the PM side? Department. Departmental. Do you use VAs? Virtual yes. assistants. Yeah. Do you have a BDM? Yes. I have a BDM. What is one piece of advice you would give someone just starting out in the PM business? Don't. <laughs> uh, no, that sounds awful. Um, know your audience. Know your target market? Or what do you mean by know yeah. your audience? Find your niche. Know okay. your audience. Find your niche. Does pineapple belong on pizza? No. What book are you currently reading or one that has impacted your business or life? Um, well, one that I feel has impacted is um, Simon Sinek, um, Start With Why. And I literally just bought, and now I have to, sh I'm literally pulling up my Audible. I literally just bought a book this morning that I wanted to read. Um, Tip people, leaders are readers. Mm -hmm. um, I read a lot. But, oh, I will say this. Another really great book is um, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. If you haven't read it, read it. Love that book. Quick read, and it's, and it's in storytelling mode, but that's a really great idea in that pyramid. Yeah, you, I'll, I'll stop there. That's a good one. What Disney character do you most associate with? Cinderella. <laughs> that does not surprise me. What is one challenge you're currently facing in your business? Time management. What do you prefer, dogs or cats? Dogs. Dog person, like myself. Well, see, the lightning round wasn't that bad, Deb. I appreciate that. Um, so just uh, if you are listening to this podcast and you want to join NARPM, uh, just simply go to narpm.org, narpm.org, or you can call them at 800-782-3652. Thanks again, uh, Deb Newell, for, uh, for uh, bestowing some knowledge on us. My name is Pete Newbig, CEO and co-founder of VPM Solutions. If you are looking for a virtual assistant, go to vpmsolutions.com. Till next time.